Welcome, everyone. We'll get started here in just a few minutes as people are still joining the webinar. Thanks, everyone, for being on time. Alrighty, folks, thanks everyone for being here. We're still about one more minute until the top of the hour, and we'll get started. Just to make sure the chat and Q&A is working, I'd love to hear where everyone is from in the chat, if you wouldn't mind posting your city or state or country, wherever you're at. Love to see where everyone's at. Awesome, Missouri, Phoenix, Arizona, Concord, California. San Ramano, California, Chicago, Portland, Oregon. Awesome. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Love a local native. Uh, Fulton, California, Glendale, California, Massachusetts, Long Beach, California. Awesome. Love it. I love everyone uh, from all around the country joining in. Thanks so much for being here. So awesome. We're going to jump right in uh, to the agenda and the presentation today. We got a full agenda, so I want to make sure we cover everything, and uh, we got a lot we're going through. So looking really forward to it. This is a topic that, as a company, we're really passionate about. We're a fully remote company. We've been a hybrid company in the past. We support a lot of fully remote companies and a lot of hybrid companies, so we have a lot of expertise and knowledge around this. A little bit about us, um, NW Techs. We are a IT provider, really helping organizations focus more on revenue generating activities, and we'll handle the IT. So we help people uh, buy back time and ultimately uh, focus more on things that grow their business. A little bit about me, I'm the director of marketing for NW Techs. My journey with technology actually started around 18 years ago when I got my first laptop and I told my dad, and he tells me this story all the time because it's, it's quite funny. I told my dad when I got my first laptop at age 12, I told him that I don't need legs anymore because I have this powerful tool. And at an early age, I grasped the power of technology and the ability to really solve problems. Fast forward years later, I've been at NW Techs for over five years, and I've had the privilege of working with countless organizations on really helping them leverage technology to solve problems. And just like you, I'm not an engineer. I'm actually not a tech person at all. Really, I'm not a technician or an engineer. I'm actually a, a more of a user of technology like you. I really care about the outcomes and how it can drive better outcomes for our organization. So uh, we actually do a bunch of these types of webinars on different subjects. You can actually head over to nwtechs.com slash webinars if you want to learn about cybersecurity, um, Microsoft 365, all sorts of different topics. And our, and our, and our promise to you is that in this next hour, we're gonna spend at least 90% of the time, probably 95% of the time educating you. I don't wanna waste your time. I'm not gonna spend this entire presentation or have this big pitch at the end for our services. Our goal here is to provide knowledge and help you. And that's what our whole ethos of our company is, is to really take care of people and to really help them drive the needle with technology to solve more problems. So awesome, let's jump right into the agenda. First thing we're going to uh, tackle is kind of the benefits of remote and hybrid offices. We're going to talk through that a little bit. We're going to then go through the six challenges of a remote office and how to create a remote virtual office or a hybrid office and how to overcome them. The first one we're going to tackle is measuring and ensuring productivity, right? That's a hard thing to see if everyone's distributed or if you're distributed half the time. How do you measure productivity? How do you make sure people are driving results for your organization? Number two is staying connected. That's probably one of the, a really big one of, hey, how do we continue to stay connected, make sure people are connected with our clients, but then also connected with each other, right, in, the, in your team. Next one is we're going to talk about the benefits, pros and cons of hybrid versus fully remote. We're going to talk about building a culture remotely. Um, a big, big question mark, right? Big challenge of how do we make sure we build a uh, culture remotely? Next, we're going to talk about cybersecurity. The landscape has changed. If, uh, if you're not all in the office and everyone's distributed, you have all sorts of different um, issues and, and challenges with a distributed workforce when it comes to cybersecurity. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about tech burnout. This, this last subject is probably one I'm most passionate about. I was having breakfast with my wife this morning and I was telling her about this presentation I was doing. And she's like, Taylor, you could probably spend hours just talking about that one piece. 
because uh, it's something I'm super passionate about. It's something I'm as, as a user that's in front of the computer eight to 10 hours a day or in front of a screen all the time. How do we avoid tech burnout along with these other challenges as well? Last but not least, we'll have a Q&A at the end. We had hundreds of questions submitted. Um, so thank you when you registered for the webinar. And we've been able to, no pun intended, tailor this presentation to uh, to your specific questions. But if you have additional questions, please submit them in the, in the Q&A. Um, you you'll see that right in the middle of the screen, the Q&A uh, button. You can and make sure you submit it there. That way I, I check it and I can make sure um, we, we cover it. Awesome. Let's try, let's jump into the first thing. So this picture, I love this picture, um, and we're talking about the benefits of working remotely. And that's this is like the idealistic picture, right? Of working remotely. You're on the beach. You got your sun hat on. Well, first of all, this is a fantasy because if anybody's worked on the beach, they realize you can really only do it for about ten to fifteen minutes because you need sunscreen. You get sand all on your computer. Uh, I've worked remotely all around the world, Japan, Mexico, Europe, all over the country. Uh, and I actually worked in Mexico for over a month and uh, remotely. And I got to tell you, working on the beach doesn't really work. So this is actually not really one of the benefits, even though traveling and working remotely is awesome. Working on the beach on a laptop any longer than an hour just doesn't really work. You get sand and you can't really even see the screen. Like that's another thing too. You can't even see the screen. So uh, I put this in here to hopefully make you laugh, but uh, also realize that this is kind of a fantasy when it comes to working remotely. Uh, there's obviously a ton of benefits of working remotely while traveling, maybe not so much on the beach. So uh, all seriousness, let's take through the, the first one here is of working remotely is you can actually hire people anywhere. So us as a company, we went fully remote um, uh, almost, uh, I guess, in March but of this year, but even before that, we were working remotely uh, because of the pandemic. And we've been able to hire people all across the country now. We have employees in Texas, in New Jersey, in New York. And before we were specifically a local company here in Portland, Oregon, and really regional, right? We had clients on the West Coast, but now we're able to hire people remotely. I'll talk about strategies for how to hire people remotely and how to do it well later on, um, and some tips for how to do it. But Big picture, one of the great benefits is hiring people remotely. Um, something you've heard about and, and a huge benefit, something we've been able to attest to. Portland, Oregon is one of the most expensive large cities to live in. Um, taxes, uh, real estate, uh, and, and it's really hard to find good talent here. So we were actually able to go outside of Portland and uh, to, to find people that are awesome culture fits and we love all our new team members that are remote. But next thing is get clients anywhere as well. So since the pandemic, we were starting to get clients in other places uh, pre-pandemic, just because the nature of what we do, we can service people remotely. Not This is not for everyone, right? Some people are very local focused where they have to be on site or in person. That's not so much our model. And a lot of models, if you're a law firm or accounting firm, financial firm, a lot of those models actually work really well remotely. And a lot of our clients have moved to that model as well, where they can service people remotely. But it's been it's been amazing. The pandemic has pushed people to get used to meeting people remotely and getting taken care of remotely. If you can solve a problem and you can provide value, a, a term I've heard, location agnostic. You don't need to be physically there, and and ultimately people are are looking for you to solve problems, right? Uh, and drive value for their organization. They don't really most of the time they don't care if they shake your hand or if you're in person especially newer, uh, newer generations as a, as a uh, millennial. And I know Gen Z's, they really care about, Hey, how can I get the most value for the lowest cost relationship is important, but it's definitely down the list of as far as like actually meeting somebody in person. So uh, it's been pretty cool. We've been able to service clients remotely internationally because of that. And a lot of, we've been able to help our clients do that as well. Number three is no office or overhead. Um, or central point of failure. So this is an obvious one, right? No office. Uh, we got rid of our office back in March or February, went fully to a virtual office. But then also we moved our infrastructure to completely cloud-based, which we'll talk about in a little bit as far as um, one of the challenges in making sure you're cloud-based. And uh, you don't have a central point of failure, right? Which is, which is huge. Next is no commute. Um, and people will probably work more because there is no commute. And uh, studies have shown since the pandemic, people are working now more than ever, which is a problem, right? And, we, and we'll talk about that in, in tech burnout and just burnout in general towards the end, which is a problem, right? We can't 
we, to create a culture where people are thriving and healthy, we got to have boundaries. But ultimately, if they're not commuting, they're probably going to have more times to um, to ultimately work, right? And and have more brain space to it. And I know personally, I've worked now more now than I ever have um, because I don't have to commute and and I'm more efficient in that way. Um, easily scalable and downscale. So you're able to uh, scale and grow and, and retract much easier. You don't have to open up a new office, the physical space. Um, you can add people remotely and then also uh, downsides if you need to as well. Awesome. And then last but not least, uh, greater reach of service and time zones. So uh, once again, working remotely or a hybrid model, you can have a greater reach of services, right? You can service people in greater regions, but then also time zones too. You can grow into different time zones. Uh, we have employees in different time zones now, which gives us the ability to have greater reach. We're able to have more people available more often. And then obviously uh, we can get clients anywhere too. So tremendous upside, right? All these things have a tremendous upside um, to your business and can ultimately increase revenue, reduce costs and ultimately grow your business. But let's talk about the downsides, right? Because these are all great. And we've a lot of these you probably have heard about, or maybe you haven't heard about in the, in the specific context, but there's there's a lot of uh, upsides, but let's talk about the downsides. So um, there's challenges and how to overcome them. So the first challenge we're going to jump right into is measuring and ensuring performance. So number one is uh, key performance indicators. So something that is super helpful, whatever size organization you are, is that ideally every team member should have some sort of key performance indicator. So big picture, as a company as a whole, you should have six to eight key performance indicators that go through things like, are we, are we meeting EBITDA, right? Are we actually generating profits? What's our guests, our customer satisfaction score, right? Are people happy? What's our turnover rate, right? Are people leaving us? Um, those are a couple leading indicators and um, and tailing indicators. Things like are employees leaving, right? Employee turnover. Um, another one would be uh, those are probably the main four, and there's other ones too. Especially on depending on industry you're in, you may have specific key in indicators. So big picture, as an organization, you should have these. So you as a business owner should know if your company is actually succeeding or what areas you can improve on. But each department and employee should also have key performance indicators so you can measure the impact of their organization. For example, I run the marketing and sales department for NW Techs, Northwest Technology Group. So a lot of my key performance indicators are things like how many people are we talking to each month? How many leads are we generating? How many deals are we closing? Um, how much traffic is going to the website? How many, you know, close, uh, win to close ratio, win to loss ratio do we have? These are key performance indicators that I share with my boss and we work through to make sure we're on track for growth and success in our organization. So this is one cool way where it's like, hey, my boss, Justin, the owner of the company and CEO of the company doesn't need to worry about what I'm doing in my department and how our, my department's succeeding. And if I'm working enough, right? It's because if I'm achieving the goals and outcomes, then uh, when I work, how I work, to what extent, if I'm working at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. or in Mexico or in Japan, then it doesn't really matter because I'm driving the results that are needed for the company. Next thing is create extreme ownership. This is another thing that I love about our company is that each person, whether they're a leader of a department or an individual um, entry level position has extreme ownership around their position, right? And there's tons of great books around it. Actually, Extreme Ownership is a book <laughs> that you can go read about extreme ownership. That is super helpful uh, for if you give people the ability to ultimately take ownership you and have accountability, you have no idea um, how far they'll push, right? And, and how far they'll go because it's their baby, right? It's their department, it's their job, it's their responsibilities. A lot of this has to fall on the key performance indicators, right? If I have extreme ownership around a specific metrics, I'm all about that. I live and breathe those metrics and I live and breathe those outcomes. Next one is regular check-ins, right? Uh, especially remotely, you need to have regular check-ins, whether it's weekly, bi-weekly, monthly with your team. We have a regular uh, team lunch. So every Friday, we all have a virtual lunch where we all grab our lunch. Or if we're not on, if we're not having lunch, we just get around, get on, uh, get on teams for 45 minutes, talk about our week, um, talk about big picture stuff that we want to talk about with the whole team. Really helpful to continue that, that plug-in and check-in. 
Uh, remember, um, hours worked is not an indicator of outcomes value created. I think one of the biggest things around this past year that has taught us with the pandemic is that uh, you know, you, your employees clocking in and clocking out is, is not an indicator of actually driving results uh, because people have worked all sorts of strange hours, less, some less, some more, and, and have driven those values. Awesome. Let's move to the next challenge here is staying connected. So we got a bunch in here. I'm going to give you about five or six different things you should have in place to make sure your organization stay connected. And we implement these things for our clients all the time. Number one is moving to the cloud. I love this very ambiguous picture of clouds because, you know, what is the cloud? It's a very nebulous concept, but the cloud is essentially anything that's not locally, uh, um, locally stored or, or managed, right? So if you have a server in your office, that's not the cloud. That is, you know, a physical on-premise server. The cloud would be moving that server to the cloud, right? So number one is uh, in staying connected is you need to move everything to the cloud. Uh, you can still do things remotely or have a hybrid model if you have things on premise, but it's way harder, way more costly, way harder to manage. If everything's in the cloud, you have so much more benefits. If you're a small or medium sized business, there's virtually no reason, no pun intended, <laughs> that you should have uh, ultimately on premise equipment, Eve servers, networking equipment, things like that. Um, moving all that stuff to the cloud has a tremendous amount of benefits. Very rarely do we find um, with our clients that they need on-premise equipment like a server. So some of the benefits um, are, uh, or some of the ideas around here, and you can have a have trust that the majority of the Fortune 500 companies are in the cloud, right? Um, so people are utilizing it. Benefits are the cloud is more stable and has faster performance than any server you have, right? You don't need a VPN to log in, which takes down bandwidth and is super um, has has issues. If your power goes out, your internet goes out, you have a fire, your whole your whole um, your whole ultimately your whole infrastructure is down, right? Whereas the, the the cloud, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, the double triple redundancy your servers um, much more stable and much faster. The cloud helps improve security and enables compliance. So you know, as much as we all feel this this sense of like, oh, if I have all my data in my office or if I can touch it and feel it, then it's more secure. And I think we should ultimately let that uh, idea go to rest because it's not. It's trying to secure things locally is way harder. Um, these Fortune 500 companies, uh, or excuse me, these Google, Microsoft, they spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in security to ultimately um, uh, make sure things are secure and compliant. And then you can also demonstrate compliance. If you're a law firm, a financial firm, an accounting firm, a healthcare organization, demonstrating compliance is huge. Even if you're a marketing agency that works with a lot of data, you demonstrating compliance for your clients is also huge. So improving security, demonstrating compliance, um, and enabling compliance is much easier in the cloud. Let's move on to the cloud helps you reduce cost. So um, the cloud helps you reduce costs in the sense that, yes, you have to pay for some sort of subscription to have your stuff in the cloud. But like all the reasons I mentioned, right, um, servers are so expensive to maintain. If, you're, if you've ever done any sort of IT or if you've ever talked to your IT provider, or if you have somebody like us doing your IT and outsource IT provider, they'll tell you the server is the most complex pain uh, point in your organization when it comes to technology. So if you can reduce that, you can reduce your overhead. You have to buy a new server every five or six years, right? Which costs five, five, ten, dollars $15,000. If you have multiple ones, right? If you have five to 10 servers, that's super expensive. Um, and then the maintenance is just so much higher. So I see some questions coming in. I, awesome. Thank you so much for submitting questions. Please continue to submit questions and we'll get to them um, towards the end as well. Submit them in the Q&A &A, Q &A portion. The cloud helps you simplify IT management. I kind of already touched on that when it comes to IT management. The cloud promotes agility and keeps you current. So the big thing about uh, the cloud is um, you can scale, right? If you want to open, uh, add more employees or add another serve, add another virtual server or add another program, you can do that quickly. You don't have to set up a server. Servers take a long time to set up. You have to purchase them, set them up, um, all that fun stuff. And it keeps you current, right? Having to 
update the servers, keep them patched, all that fun stuff. Once again, it's challenging. You can fall behind. The best part about moving to the cloud is this picture, which I love. I found this on the internet. I laughed so hard. You can get rid of that old server, right? And that server room, um, take it out of the backyard. Don't necessarily recommend this at home, but um, there might be some uh, ecological ramifications of putting water on your server. But super funny picture of like, hey, servers are such a pain point, right? Um, for organizations and ha hold so many problems, whether it's a VPN, whether it's the power going out or the internet going out and your infrastructure going down, whether it's just the cost to maintain it, patching it, um, all sorts of different issues. Moving to the cloud, you can get rid of that. Something we do for our clients all the time, and especially over the past couple of years, I, I, every company I talk to, it's almost a cloud migration, right? We're moving them to the cloud just because a lot of organizations are moving that direction. So definitely something to consider if you're not already there. Awesome. Next area is video conferencing done right. So um, one area of technology uh, in staying connected, right? So the first one we talked about is moving to the cloud. The second one is video conferencing. Video conferencing is crucial for staying connected uh, when you are working in a hybrid model or remote. So number one is kind of some tips, right? Of video conferencing done right is first, number one, have your face fill up at least half the screen. That way they can see your expressions. They can see your wrinkles see your flaws um, in all seriousness, though, it makes you relatable, makes you human, right? Is that you want things to be as high resolution as possible to try to try to replicate what's in person, right? Nothing's going to be the same as in person when it comes to the dimensions and, and, and the and the quality. But if you get as close to it as possible, it does help and it makes your video conferencing experience better and more intimate and more uh, uh, personal. Next is raise your hands, uh, raise your hand um, during meetings. There's functions in Zoom and Microsoft Teams where you can raise your little button that says raise your hand. That way you're not talking over each other. I think it's very natural. Um, you know, I was actually talking to uh, um, my, my nieces and nephews, they're younger, and we're, we were talking about interrupting and the proper way to interrupt. And it's very nuanced, right? When you're in person, like when you want to interject a thought, you have to be it's very nuanced and inter interrupting people is is there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it on video conferencing there's no right way to do it interrupting is super hard and it's very disruptive um and there's really no natural way to interrupt somebody or to insert so raising your hand that way people know you want to say something is the best way mute yourself when you're not talking turn off video with when you have bad reception this is something that's huge Internet's quality is not always great, right? You're traveling or you, or something's just not going right with your computer and you know the video is, is off. Just turn off your video. Um, Microsoft Teams has a cool feature where you can turn off incoming video and outbound video. So you can turn off all the video for, for people that are on video. Super cool feature that if you're having internet issues, just turn off your video, right? Like, hey, turn off your video. It's an easy solve. Just go straight to audio um, if you're having in internet issues. Another best tip here is have great audio. Right now I'm using like a $200 podcasting mic to do this webinar and I use it for every single meeting I'm in. That way I can have crisp audio. The words you're saying are the most powerful form of communication you're gonna have when it comes to meetings, right? How you look, your mannerisms, your PowerPoint, whatever, that's all secondary. What's the most powerful thing that's happening right now is the words I'm saying, right? And and those being crystal clear and those being as, as high quality as possible is super important. What's also important is great audio. So great audio is also, or excuse me, great video is also important too. Um, I use like a $2,000 camera for, for webinars and video conferencing and stuff like that because um, we're in the tech industry and we want to use the best of the best. That's overkill, right, for most organizations. But have a nice webcam, right? Have a 4K webcam. Um, to make sure um, during the pandemic, we bought our entire team 4K webcams, right? That way their video quality was this top notch. We started buying lamps for everyone. That way they had nice uh, light, you know, $65 lamp on Amazon that makes your lighting look great um, and makes sure people can see your face. These little details help. These little details matter when you're working remotely or having some virtual, virtual meeting. Um, stand up when presenting. Right now I'm not standing up, uh, but generally speaking, um, I like to stand up when presenting, uh, when you're in a sales meeting or when you're in presenting with your team, you have better energy. Uh, you're, you're just going to present better if you're standing. Wear clothes that make you feel and look professional. You know, the age of wearing 
uh, slippers and, you know, the whole joke of um, it only matters what you're wearing up top. Who cares what's wearing down below? I think that's a little um, short sighted. Ultimately, when you're wearing professional clothes and you're wearing a collared shirt and you're wearing pants that feel good, but also make you feel professional makes a difference, right? Especially when we're ultimately coming to work, um, it, it, it makes a difference. And, you know, if I'm not in a video conference or if I'm even working on projects, sure, I might wear, you know, a t-shirt and I'm not gonna necessarily dress up. But if I'm on video conferencing, if I'm going to a meeting, I'm, I do my hair, I wear a nice collared shirt, I put on nice shoes. That way it creates an experience for me and for the audience that I take this seriously and that I'm here to work and, and uh, create value and solve problems. Awesome. Next area I wanna dive into is how to stay connected is record everything. So what we did, and this is not necessarily a new concept for a lot of organizations, but it is maybe for you, is that you should record everything. And um, here's a bunch of things um, I'm gonna talk through here is record meetings, uh, excuse me, record interviews. One thing we did, it was so cool. When we started hiring people remotely, as we actually started recording all of our interviews with these potential hires, and it was amazing. Like, so Thursday morning, we had our first interview with the employee. We recorded the meeting, shared it with other team members that were, were a part of it. Two things happened. Number one, we saved other people's time because they didn't need to go to the interview, right? And then number two, we were able to get more eyes and ears into it uh, and eyes and ears into this interview um, and perspective on it. Um, and then they watched the interview. We were able to have a second interview by Thursday afternoon or Friday morning and have a job offer by Friday afternoon. Within less than 48 hours, we had multiple interviews. That's just the power of remote and hybrid model, right? We had multiple interviews, but then we were able to have multiple people view the interview because it was recorded and because we had that ability. Zoom, Microsoft Teams have easy ways to record things and share it with your team members. And we do that all the time. And it's amazing how much faster, basically time to decision-making was so much faster because of recording and our ability to ultimately uh, make decisions quicker. Other things we record is sales conversations. I'm actually having a, a large sales meeting with a potential client tomorrow that I'm gonna review the sales initial sales meetings this afternoon because I recorded all the sales meetings. I'm actually able to go back and look at, okay, make sure I have, you know, I take notes during meetings, but make sure, was there anything I missed? Make sure I have all the information for our follow-up meeting tomorrow. Also great for training too, as we train more people and as we bring more people on the team, we'll have like, hey, here's a great sales meeting. Here's not a great sales meeting uh, or, or whatnot uh, that we did. Uh, customer service calls, right? Or service calls, record those. Um, I, Justin, one of our, our, our CEO and owner, um, sent me a recording of a call with a client that had a particular problem that he wanted me to jump on and help them solve. I was able to listen to the call, schedule a meeting with them, and I even told them on the call, hey, I listened to your call with Justin. I'm up to speed on what's going on. Let's hit the ground running. Saves time. Um, you also, quality assurance, right? It's a classic, you know, listening to calls to make sure quality assurance, but then just uh, collaborating with your team. They're like, hey, listen to the, the first five minutes of this call so you can get up to speed on what they said. Get the nuances, get the tonality, understand exactly what's going on in that meeting. Um, internal one-on-ones, right? Record those. That way you can review them later down the road and, and ensure that you followed up on issues or performances or that everyone's on the same team. Team meetings. We record our team meetings most of the time. That way if somebody misses the team meeting, they can watch it, right? They're out of the office on Friday. They don't make it to the lunch. Record it. That way other people can see it if they're not at the meeting. Recording is huge. I think it's one of the coolest parts of being virtual is that it's really hard to document things that are in person, right? You can't record, you're not gonna put a little recorder on the table when you're meeting with your team. Like that's probably not gonna happen. Uh, but with virtual and hybrid, we're a virtual office, you can record so much more, have so much more documentation, review performance, all these different reasons here. Super cool feature and, and way to help you stay connected. The next area as keeping you connected is team collaboration tools. So uh, team, team, Microsoft Teams and Slack are the two main team collaboration tools out there. And these tools really came out of organizations that are trying to stay connected remotely, right? You know, you wanna, you wanna message somebody, but you don't wanna say text them because that's weird and texting coworkers and, and your boss is weird and hard to track and 
Um, you don't necessarily want to call them. And then it's team collaboration kind of fits right in the middle of you don't necessarily want to call them and interrupt a meeting or if they're not available, but you also don't necessarily want to send them an email, which is not very time sensitive. Team collaboration tools like Teams or Slack are awesome for this. Highly recommend this tool as well if you don't have one of these in place to make sure you stay connected and create that virtual office. We have a whole webinar on team Microsoft Teams in particular on our website. If you want to go check that out, I'm not going to spend a ton of time diving into that. Project management tools. This is another area that's super important for making sure you stay connected and making sure you're on track. So project management, this is actually a screenshot of how we use ClickUp, which is a great uh, project management tool. Other ones out there, Monday, Asana, Trillo, uh, Basecamp. Um, Click, ClickUp is the one we personally like, but we help our clients with all the other ones as well if they need help with them. Um, but ultimately, it's a, it's a way for you to track long-term projects or complex issues, right? And make sure you're following up on them. Important tool to have in your tech stack. Next tool you should have in your tech stack is a CRM or a practice management tool or a customer service tool. So we use HubSpot um, and uh, as our CRM, we also use a PSA tool for our ticketing software as well. And um, we uh, and there's a couple other tools we use as well, but ultimately having some sort of Tra track record and, and uh, customer record management tools, what CRM stands for, or if you're a law firm or accounting fool, maybe a practice management software. If you're more just a service-based industry that doesn't do a whole lot of sales or marketing, maybe just a, a service-based ticketing software. But the reason why this is so important is, so we have our team collaboration tool, like we talked about, right? Where you, you're, you're communicating internally, you're communicating externally with your clients, very much a communication tool. Project management is more big, big picture stuff. CRM is really for helping you manage your customers, your clients, your client interaction, and your project and your practice, and, and ultimately how you interact with your clients, tracking activity. Each one of these tools are super important and they all serve a specific need. Um, your team collaboration is about communication. Your projects is around complex, detailed, long term projects, actually, how you deliver. How are you actually servicing your clients, right? What are the things you have to do to deliver your product or service? And then your CRM, your practice management tools around tracking activity, tracking communication with your clients. They all serve very three and very important issues. And, you know, there's ways to get around it where you don't necessarily need a CRM, right? If you're using maybe Microsoft 365 or there's ways around it. But if you want to be a high performing virtual or hybrid organization that has a virtual office, these three tools are super important. Once again, a team collaboration tool project management tool, and a CRM slash practice management tool. Another cool, really uh, important feature working remotely is having automatic scheduling. So this is actually my schedule. We use HubSpot to do all this. Calendarly is also another tool we use to do all this as well as popular. Automatic scheduling. I can't tell you how many hours this saves me from going back and forth and figuring out a time um, and what works for our clients. People can just go and book a time on our calendar. Super easy. And, and ultimately, this is um, uh, just a way to save so much time, right? If you're meeting over Zoom or meeting on the phone, you don't necessarily need to figure out a location. Even if you're figuring out a location, have them go book a time on your calendar, send them a link to your calendar. Um, there's lots of tools that can do this. Microsoft has a Microsoft Meetings. HubSpot has a, a free calendar tool you can use. Calendarly has a tool you can use. So powerful. You'll save so much time, so much headache. Um, so much quicker and just things will get on the calendar, super powerful and very important in making sure you can you can uh, perform on a high level. Um, and yeah, once again, saves time, but then also just helps you. So if you want to implement any of these tools, please reach out to us. We can, we can help you uh, go to the cloud, help you use the best tech around, ensure your organization is secure. You can go to nwtechs.com slash let's talk and uh, I'll put that link in the chat and you can book a time with us and we can talk through any one of these tools. We can talk through your current tech stack um, and, and talk through ultimately how to utilize all these tools. So let's jump right into the next topic here, which is the next challenge, which is um, challenge number three, working in a hybrid or a fully remote office, right? So, and a lot of companies, you know, we see, 
there's companies that like us that have doubled down on working remotely, right? And that works for our organization. That could work for a lot of uh, maybe your organization as well. Happy to talk through the pros and cons for that for your organization. But that's not for everyone. Some organizations need a hybrid model. So let's talk through kind of the pros and cons of that. And I'm going to keep this brief because um, ultimately uh, there is there there's really the biggest part is hybrid is a harder model to implement. If you go either fully remote or fully in person, that is easier than having having a hybrid model for a couple of reasons. Even in this picture right now, I'll talk to you about kind of what we've seen over the past couple of years of, of people doing this and even through this past year, a year and a half of the pandemic, is that there creates this, this animosity right here. If you're looking at the screen between the person on the screen and everyone else in the meeting, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a meeting where there's three or four three or four people in front of a camera right in front of a screen and 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 we're virtual and the people that are around the desk they're all like talking you know to each other they're communicating to each other it creates this really awkward barrier between the people in the room and the people virtual and the people that are that are remote you've also probably seen studies that are coming out that uh there is there's kind of the remote employees and the virtual and the, and the on-premise employees and it creates challenges, right? There's benefits to it, don't get me wrong. Like having people come into the office is great. But what I recommend and what we've seen to be really successful is just ultimately, um, like I mentioned, fully remote and fully in person is, is easier. Just pick one or the other. If you are gonna go hybrid model, the one thing I can't stress more is don't try to do hybrid meetings. Go fully remote, you know, go everyone's at their own desk, if you're gonna do a virtual meeting, having half the people in, in the office, half the people not, it does not create a, a, uh, a synergistic collaboration. It only, uh, ultimately creates a barrier between you and the other employees. Maybe down the road, 10 years down the road, we all have holograms and we're all in our own little desk around the table, we can make it work. But the technology is not there ultimately to create a seamless interaction between hybrid for create a hybrid meeting right where some people are in person and some people are remote so once again i can't stress it more if you are going to go the hybrid model which there's nothing wrong with that there's benefits to that make sure all your virtual meetings are fully virtual right i know it seems counterintuitive in some ways if there's five people in the office to go around the desk and, and go on virtual but it, it creates a weird dynamic and meetings don't go as well. If everyone is virtual, everyone's on the same playing field versus trying to do um, trying to do both. And uh, and so that's the biggest thing I wanna stress between the, the two. Like I mentioned, hybrid has its place. There's benefits to people coming in the office and having that collaboration. The one thing I will stress though, is make sure all your virtual meetings are fully virtual. Don't try to do a hybrid model. Awesome. So our next challenge is cultural building. So in this picture, obviously, when you are virtual, it's hard for you to all get, get around and give you a nice, a, uh, a nice enthusiastic high five and, and have that interpersonal stuff. So we're gonna talk about kind of cultural building, how to, how to do this well remotely and the things we've learned from doing this. So number one is uh, compensate. So culture building, wanna make sure people are included, compensate for like things you would normally if people were in the office. So for coffee, buy, continue to buy people's equipment. Uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes when it comes to cybersecurity, it's really not best practice for people to use personal equipment. From a cybersecurity standpoint, don't use personal equipment. I can't stress that more. Um, and so you should be purchasing people's equipment. They should not be using personal equipment. This also makes people feel like, hey, the desk I'm at, the computer I'm at, it's the companies, right? It creates that, that, that uh, synergy between the two. Other things to think about are weekly check-ins with the team and direct reports. We talked about that earlier in regards to having a team meeting, right? Every week um, or, or weekly meetings with your direct reports or bi-weekly or monthly meetings with your direct reports. Other things you can do are non-work channels on Teams and Slack. One really cool way that we and, and a lot of the organizations do is on Teams, which Microsoft Teams is what we use, and we're definitely a Microsoft partner and reseller, and we, we are heavily invested in that ecosystem, is have non-work channels on there, right? So we have one that's, um, you know, uh, things like funny memes that we've seen online, funny jokes we've seen online. We have ones that are, 
Um, what have you been doing over the weekend, right? Or, you know, this things we want to share, non-personal things, water cooler type conversations you can facilitate through those channels. Another thing you can do is uh, uh, fun non-work virtual events. Some of the things we've done are, um, and, and we'll continue to do our game night. So once a month we have a virtual game night and we play, um, we play golf with friends and it's like a putt putt golf game. And it's super simple, super easy. We can all get on it and spend 45 minutes an hour just playing putt putt golf online. Right. And maybe that's not for you, but it's a great way just to unwind, you know, grab an adult beverage or all this hanging out. You don't have to talk about work. It's, it's silly enough that it creates just a fun way for you to blow off some steam, laugh with your coworkers, have an adult beverage virtually or, or whatnot and just chill, right? And just an opportunity to laugh and, and not have any pressures of work. Another important things are holiday parties, or you can do a virtual white elephant exchange. That's one thing we're gonna try to do this year is a virtual white elephant exchange. Um, and where you can, and it's pretty fun, where you can do a virtual white elephant exchange. Um, and we've seen companies do that. Another things I've seen companies do are uh, monthly um, uh, uh, town halls, right? Where you get everyone together for an hour or 45 minutes where you just talk, right? About work issues, non-work issues. And, and um, you know, the CEO or the, or the leader of the company can come in and just answer questions um, or leadership can be available to answer questions and a nice just open form for just open dialogue around growth, long-term things. That's another really cool way. So these things are great opportunities. Um, if you do have a hybrid model, you know, you can come in together in person or we've seen companies, if you're a small company um, um, and uh, ultimately you will uh, do a great job of, of maybe doing some in-person events, right? Maybe once a year, you all come together in person. And uh, we've seen a lot of virtual companies do that or remote companies do that, come together once a year fly everyone together, have a, you know, a weekend at the beach or something, and you all just have a fun time doing stuff like that. So awesome. Let's move into our next challenge here, um, which is challenge number five, cybersecurity. So the landscape has changed, right? When it comes to virtual uh, working remotely and cybersecurity is really important in, in the office, but also remote too. So these are some of the things you should think about when creating a virtual office um, um, or, you know, fully remote or, or hybrid as well. So number one, everything should be cloud-based. That's gonna help you with cybersecurity. Move it to the cloud. Like I mentioned earlier, there's tons of benefits for cybersecurity and compliance. Number two, use a password manager. You know, if you're not in person, you can't just go over to somebody's desk and be like, hey, what's that password for that corporate, you know, Amazon account we have or, or whatnot. You can't do that. And it's really hard to share passwords in person with people. So use a password manager. This is just a general best practice in general. We have a webinar just on password managers because it's such a huge part of, of security and saving time. I think I save 15 minutes a day with a password manager. Huge for cybersecurity. One password, last pass are great solutions for that. Uh, use only company owned equipment. So a bad habit we've seen a lot of companies get into, especially with when everyone remotely is like, oh, you know, I'm gonna use my personal desktop or my personal iPad to access work stuff. Don't do that. There's a ton of cybersecurity risks that you open yourself up to. Your IT provider or your IT manager doesn't have um, ultimately uh, the ability to have eyes and ears into that system. So use only company owned equipment. Crucial aspect here um, is maybe not business class equipment, right? It may not have encryption built in. If it's equipment bought from Costco, no offense to Costco, I love it. It may be consumer grade equipment, which is not super secure, especially if you're a law firm, financial firm, a healthcare organization, you deal with a lot of sensitive information, financial firm, you have to use business class equipment um, and, using and using personal equipment usually is not. Use only encrypted equipment, kind of hinted at this before, right? You should only use encrypted equipment, not consumer grade equipment. Um, MFA should be enabled and enforced. We actually just talked to a client recently that they had it in, in, enabled where everyone had it enabled, but it wasn't really enforced across the organization. MFA is super important just as a general cybersecurity best practice, but um, enforced meaning that you have to, and you have to you know, keep up with it. Um, another way too is is making sure you're authenticating um, every um, every so often, right? Where it logs you out after 30 days of all your devices, and you have to re-authenticate yourself, um, and uh, super important. 
provide ongoing cybersecurity training. Lots of great questions coming in, in the chat and the Q&A. We'll be sure to answer those two folks um, in a few minutes as we get to the, the Q&A portion. Provide ongoing cybersecurity training. Um, this is super important uh, as the threats change, right? Since everyone's working remotely, there's all sorts of home office scams out there now that people need to be aware of. These are these are all things we provide for our clients as well and help them implement and help them uh, make sure they implement as well. Last but not least, ensure your practices are compliant. So if you are working from home, if you do have a virtual office, hybrid or fully remote, make sure they're compliant with whatever regulatory organization you're involved in. It's another thing we help our clients with as well. Challenge number six, last but not least, tech burnout. This picture right here <laughs> is a great, <clears throat> excuse me, is a great symbol of device prolification, right? There's so, we have so many devices in front of us, whether it's a smartphone, iPad, some of us have multiple smartphones. We have a work phone and a, and a non-work phone. We have a i an iPad, a laptop, a desktop, so many different devices. So creating boundaries is super important with our technology. Here's some best practice I have personally found super helpful. We've implemented some into our organization and we recommend to our clients and help them involve. Not every video meeting needs video on. Create a hierarchy. So I'll talk about this for a second. When you're doing video conferencing, if you're if you're like me, where you have you know five to six meetings a day uh, with external and internal uh, meetings, create a hierarchy where where maybe you turn off a couple of those meetings for video. Video conferencing is more taxing than phone calls or in person. It's just a fact. All the studies promote it. Um, that ultimately it's harder to do a video conferencing. Video conferencing has a place. It's very intimate. It's very um, intentional. It's, it's, it's more intimate than phone calls and having your video off. That being said, it, you can burn out. And for me personally, I've had to ultimately do uh, less video. And in a second, I'll talk about days I actually don't do any meetings because ultimately having so many meetings can, be, can, can really burn yourself out. So create a hierarchy for videos. Don't do every video meeting on video, right? Keep your video off, right? You want to share, do a screen sharing. If you, that's super great, right? Have that on, but turn your video off. Um, a hierarchy we do is clients. We almost always have our video on internally. We almost always have our video on for vendors and third parties. A lot of times we turn our video off. Um, and the reason why we do that is because of a hierarchy, right? We have to say no to some of them. And the most important is for our clients to see us. Um, and then it goes down from there. Next is turn off devices nights and weekends. So um, at 7 p.m. every night, I turn off my device. I don't turn it usually back on until 7 a.m. the next day. I turn off my computer on Saturday uh, and don't turn it back on, uh, or usually Friday night, don't turn it back on until Monday morning. Create boundaries, right? If you're in front of the computer eight to 10 hours a day, times that by five days a week, you're, you're in front of the computer for 50 hours a week, plus nights and mornings, you got to take a break, right? Burnout is a real thing. And if at the rate we're going now in 10 years, we're just gonna have like screens all around us, right? And we're just gonna be like hyper, hyper stimulated and, um, and ultimately need a break. So a huge thing what we do uh, and what I personally do is nights and weekends, um, I turn off all my devices. Be very strategic about notifications. So on my phone, on my computer, I only have very specific notifications that I leave on. For example, I only allow uh, phone calls to come through on my phone. I have no other notifications, no Teams, no emails, no text messaging, only phone calls. If it's an emergency, right, from a team member or a colleague or a client or my wife, then I want them to get a hold of me. Everything else is secondary and notifications are crazy, right? I can't tell you how many times I've been in a meeting and notifications are going off all around people. Attention is crucial. We have to be able to maintain attention. And all of these devices are just screaming for our attention. Um, and don't get me started on social media for, for screaming for our attention. But email is important too. And that's why I actually took email off my phone. I don't have email on my phone. I'm in front of my email for 50 hours a week. I don't need it when I'm going to the grocery store or when I'm on nights and weekends, right? I don't need to be in front of my email. And it's too tempting to go check it, right? Like, oh, does anything come in? Um, and, and ultimately to create that boundary, I actually took email off my phone along with social media and other things, uh, create, uh, focus blocks. So what, uh, another thing we do is create blocks of time. Something we do internally where we give our team members the ability to block off their calendar a couple hours a day to do projects, to just not be in meetings, not be on the phone. 
do that, create focus blocks. That way you're not inundated all the time with constant distractions. Block off your calendar for non-meeting uh, non -meeting days. So actually every Monday, um, something I've been doing for probably four or five months now is I don't, I don't accept meetings on Monday. And if you try to book a calendar time on, on my calendar, um, which some of you uh, will do, you know, after this, after this webinar um, to, to interact with us or to maybe to, to work with us or see if we can help you, uh, you won't be able to book it on Monday. And that's something I've intentionally done is first of all, most people don't like meeting on Monday anyways. Um, it's a very busy day for everyone. So I just blocked it off. That way I have no meetings on Monday. I call them no meeting Mondays. Some people do no meeting Fridays and Nike and a lot of larger organizations have done no meetings Fridays, right? Where, hey, no meetings on Fridays. Um, that way you create that boundary. Uh, for me personally, I've done no meeting Mondays. And in that way, I just have a day to work on projects, right? The other four days, I have my five to six meetings a day, right? And and uh, super fact, packed and, and, um, and ultimately busy, which is great. But creating a time to just take a break, right? Getting off the video, getting off the phone, um, and focusing on projects and and planning and things like that. Another thing here is have 15 minute breaks before meetings. Lots of studies have come out that you should have breaks between your virtual meetings. So you can set this up in your scheduling tool, right? HubSpot, like I mentioned earlier, the scheduling tool, um, which I'll show you here. You can set this up or you have breaks in between each meeting, back-to-back -back meetings, no bueno. That's super, ultimately super uh, hard to maintain and burnout is, 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 is a real thing. Go look it up. Uh, it's, it's making sure you have breaks between meetings is super important. Encourage team members to do the same. So encourage your team to do all these same things, right? If you are excited about this, or if you try a couple of these tactics, encourage your team to do the same, create a culture. Something we're working on is a technology guideline. So it's, 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 uh, we have policies for, you know, cybersecurity and, you know, bring your own device policies and privacy and all those things, terms and conditions for how our team member needs to interact with us. Um, but there's also policies for just digital health, right? And, and, and ultimately, uh, we should create a guideline for our organization for digital health. A couple other things too, are encouraging people to unplug on vacation. You know, uh, some of our employees turn, you know, delete their Teams app on their phones. That way they're not distracted by, by Teams while they're on vacation. But actually unplug, right? Actually take the time to unplug. And then last but not least, uh, encourage boundaries in your home. So I don't work in my bedroom. I don't really have any devices in my bedroom, in my kitchen, at my dining room table. Um, I'm blessed to have a dedicated office at my home. So I basically give myself two places I can work in my office and on the couch. Um, and majority of the time it's in my office, right? And the reason why I do that is once again, it's if you're having working from home or doing a hybrid, things can slip into it. And then you're just, you find yourself working at 10 PM in your bed on your phone, looking at a screen right before you go to bed, which is, which is definitely not healthy and is very problematic. So um, I hope this was super helpful. Let's jump into the Q and A. I got some great questions in here. Uh, Megan asks, can you readdress the top four performance, uh, key performance indicators? So this is in regards to measuring productivity. Um, the ones I would, I've seen a lot are number one, um, EBITDA, which is profitability. Is your company profitable, right? And you should have some goal for like, we need 5% profits or 10% profits. Um, the next thing you should track is customer or guest or a client satisfaction, right? Um, uh, CSAT, um, customer satisfaction, I forgot the acronym for it, but CSAT, customer satisfaction score. Um, and you should have a survey, right? It goes out and you can track like, oh, 95% of our customers are happy, right? And you can gauge that. Uh, another one would be uh, employee turnover, right? Are employees leaving the company at a high rate, right? What's your employee rate and turnover rate? Is it 10% a year? Is it 5%? Um, and then number, and the other ones would be uh, sales, right? Maybe new clients. Um, uh, how many new clients are you getting? Are you growing, right? Um, and then each department should have their own, right? The sales department and marketing department has their own key performance indicators. The um, you know service department has their own, right? How quickly you're getting back to clients, how quickly you're solving issues for your customers. Um, anonymous question came in, can you address ways to have a backup of the cloud and the internet going down? So um, yeah, so ultimately if you are, do you have an on-premise server, uh, it's really hard to, uh, you can do a backup of your on-premise server, and then that way, you know, you have a disaster recovery, right? If your server were to go down, we do that for our clients as well. If they do have on-premise servers and they need a backup, 
You should also have, if you're in the cloud, you should also have a backup of the cloud. Um, a little misnomer about the cloud is that they guarantee they won't lose your data. Microsoft, Google, AWS, they guarantee double, triple redundancy of their data. They won't lose it. But if you were to accidentally delete something, um, you, they may, they, it may be lost, right, for good. So ultimately, super important to back up the cloud, back up your emails, back up your files in the cloud, back up your applications just in case things get lost there. Um, a couple of questions here. Um, Maria asks, "Is it will be the, will there be a video recording? Yes, there will be a video recording, and we'll send it out to you afterwards. Um, and um, uh, and then uh, Patricia asks, uh, "What was the name of the golf game? Golf with friends was the game we use. We play internally. Super low key, super easy to play, um, super fun." And then um, Julie asked, what is MFA? MFA is multi-factor authentication. It's a level of security where you get, you know, with your bank, when you get that text message code, um, a lot of applications require it now where you have to get a second level of, of authentication with getting into your applications. You should have this standardized across every account possible, especially your email, especially your file storage, especially any applications that have sensitive data super important to have that enabled and enforced another question is here how do you deal with hard copy files and 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 uh copies this whole presentation seems to be a hard sell in remote and cloud that is fine but how do your admin employees do their work and project managers access hard files background information on projects that haven't been digitalized yet um and outside of making reports and invoices into pds how do you totally re remote with that can't you buy copiers and scanners for all your employees to use remotely ideas yes that's a great question so there's some awesome scanning tools out there um, that you can scan everything to the cloud and uh, i have one that is so fast and does such a great job that we implement for our clients as well and uh, so if you are still using paper um which is fine right um, and, but you're trying to move to a virtual cloud base. That is one thing uh, that I should have mentioned in this is that going virtual or even hybrid, doing paper is very problematic. So push your organization to go paperless. That's a huge win. There's so many advantages to it and um, and happy to, to talk through those advantages and how we've helped some clients go paperless as well. But yeah, that is one problematic issue uh, with um, uh, going, if you are an in-person company, paper is a problem right um if you're trying to do hybrid or or fully remote um having paper so ultimately i would push against that i would try to go fully digital and there's a lot of cool tools where you can create um and um you can you can have a, a an economical way to get those things into the cloud so awesome hope you enjoyed this presentation if you want help going and creating a virtual office right going completely cloud-based, utilizing the best tech around, how to secure your organization, please reach out to us. We'd love to have a conversation with you to see if we're a good fit to help you address those issues. And um, ultimately, uh, we, can, we, can, we can help you do that and, and help you utilize the best tech around, move to the cloud, and make your organization more secure. I put the link in the chat. You can book a one-on-one -on -one with us. Uh, we can help you do all that. If you have any questions about the presentation, feel free to email us, hello at nwtechs.com. We will be sending out a recording and follow up emails from this presentation with this whole presentation as well that you can share with your team um, and share the recording with your team. Thank you so much for taking and spending your valuable time with us. We really uh, honor it and super grateful for you investing in your organization and in your technology. So best of luck with everyone. Take care. Thanks again so much for, for joining us today.